This is a very nostalgic video post and a reminder of something that happened almost 30 years ago. It followed from an announcement made by the then Chancellor of the Exchequer, Norman Lamont, at his budget speech in March 1993, when he said, under my new proposals, people will have just one tax bill each year covering all their income and the self-employed will pay tax on the profits they make in the current year, not the preceding year. I now propose to offer these taxpayers, including 4 million self-employed, the option of self-assessment. That was March 1993. And shortly after the announcement, uh, I was with a couple of partners at the firm of Clark Whitehill, and we decided to write a book, this book, uh, The Essential Guide to Self-Assessment. More on that in a second. It's topical now, <laughs> at least for me and maybe others of my generation who remember that change, because, of course, there is a change happening now as in terms of basis periods for the self-employed and the choices that people have if your year end is currently sometime between October and the end of March, whether to keep that year end and have to apportion your profits every year or to change your accounting year end to 31st of March or 5th of April. And if you're going to do that, whether you do that in 2022-23, the year just gone, produce accounts to 31st of March then, or if you wait and produce accounts to 31st of March 2024, uh, or will you, if you don't change your year end, will you continue to apportion your profits between two accounting periods each year? What a nightmare. Glad I'm not in practice anymore. Why is this relevant to the essential guide to self-assessment? Well, this whole question of apportioning profits reminds me that when we wrote this book, uh, which we made a um, lever arch book so that we could uh, produce updated updates to it. I think we did two updates. And the idea is you take the pages out, the old ones, put the new ones in as the rules changed. Not the greatest idea in the world. But while we were writing this book, uh, between the three of us, uh, I was doing the calculations on spreadsheets, uh, early version, I, it might have been SuperCalc, might have been Lotus 1, 2, 3. I almost certainly wasn't using Excel. Uh, and I was having to do calculations uh, a bit like those examples there, but there are dozens and dozens of those examples in the book. And what one of the things we were doing was comparing when should you change your year end, uh, 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 ahead of the move to the self-assessment system, because previously we had what was called the prior year basis of assessment, PYB, and we were moving to a current year basis of assessment, CYB. And in order to make that transition, not only did you have to consider whether to change your accounting date to 31st of March or 5th of April, but also you're going to be combining two years profits and the question was, which two years profits should you combine? Where did you want profits to fall? Where do you want profits or losses to be? And I recognized uh, this was in the mid 1990s uh, that it was going to be a real challenge for accountants looking to advise their clients what to do, how to do it, when to make the change and to understand the rules because they would need to create their own spreadsheets. But to do that, you need to understand you, you needed to understand all the rules. Big, big challenge. So I encouraged my partners to allow me to go away and develop the first tax planning software for accountants in the UK. I put this in a recent uh, one in five quiz on my profile on LinkedIn. And uh, some people were going, you can't have done that. Well, yes, I did. It was called CyberTax. And this was a, this is the user manual from version two. Uh, CyberTax, the current year basis, current for, uh, Currently a basis tax planner. Uh, this was the user guide, ridiculous length thing. Uh, it came with a diskette tucked inside the back cover. Uh, and I wrote 80 pages of guidance here, including how to link it up to your printer and how to make use of the whole system. Because, as will be apparent in a moment, it wasn't the most modern of software packages we were using. Uh, Back in the mid 1990s, whilst I was given free reign as uh, a tax partner at the firm I was with that uh, 
uh, is now Crow UK. It was Clark Whitehill back in the day. There's the Clark Whitehill logo. Um, I was given pretty much free reign uh, with a budget, of course. Uh, I didn't understand how to write marketing uh, material effectively. I had some ideas. So this is one of the early flyers uh, that we had. And as you can see, the price we were charging for this brilliant piece of technology was only £245. Actually, it wasn't. It was £395, um, discounted to £295 if you buy within, or to £245 rather, if you buy within 14 days of anything. I, I understood that much about marketing. But look at the amount of text that I produced here. It really wasn't the best written guide in the world. But look, there is a clue to what I was talking about in terms of the technology we were using. This was a DOS based product. It was the only option at the time in the early 1990s when we conceived the idea. Uh, we offered a money back guarantee. Uh, if you didn't find that Cybertax lived up to our promises, simply tell us why. Return the diskette and user guide. Confirm no copies have been retained. We'll issue a full refund. That's a £15 handling fee. I can say hand on heart, we never had any requests that I can remember for a refund. Now, version one was very, very successful. I think we sold about 250 copies quite early on. And we started. I started putting adverts on the back of Accountancy Magazine and on the back of London Accountant Magazine, also a magazine that no longer exists. Um, prior to the adverts, uh, we were mail shotting uh, accountants. I probably bought lists of accountants in those days. You could do back then. Uh, and also when I was out lecturing, which I did around the country, even back then in the 1990s, then I talked about tax matters. Don't do that anymore. Now I talk about pretty much business development related issues for accountants in practice. Much more enjoyable for me and I don't have to keep up with tax anymore. But back in the day, I was lecturing about tax and we would we would leave out these promotional flyers wherever I was speaking. We moved on to advertising, and I remember being approached by the marketing guy at one of these magazines. Did I want to put an advert uh, on in the magazine? And uh, I wasn't a senior partner, and I claimed um, probably honestly initially um, that I didn't have authority to spend the sort of money that they wanted for advertising. Um, but they called back. And the, this was uh, this is when I learned that you'd never pay the rate card for uh, an advert in a magazine or a newspaper back in those days. Perhaps you still don't now. I don't uh, do such advertising anymore. But back in the 1990s, the first opportunity came along to agree to spend, I think it was £400 on an advert against the rate card of £2,500. And I reckoned I probably could authorized spending of £400, because as long as that enables us to sell two copies of CyberTax, we'd be making a profit. So we actually went to a, uh, a marketing design agency, and they came up with that advert, which was a lot clearer and simpler than the sort of stuff that I've been drafting. And they also produced a much better flyer. There we go. That was one of them. Talk to your clients before someone else does. This was another one, the fastest way to plan for current year basis. It was an intriguing opening uh, of the flyer. There was far fewer words in it, and there were some credibility statements uh, on the back. Uh, you'll remember I made reference this is version two. We sold about 400 copies of version two, if I remember. Before we produced it in March 1995, this was an advance notice uh, that we sent out to the first 250 or so purchasers of CyberTax. Uh, we'd surveyed them uh, in order to get their feedback on version one and what sort of things they would like to have in version two. Uh, we told them that the basic number of strategies that the software would compare for them would increase from 13 to 20. Now, it might not be so challenging now to think in terms of comparing 13 or 20 different strategies for 
where profits should fall in different years in order to uh, identify different levels of tax liability. But it was quite it was quite revolutionary to do it in those days. That's my watch talking to me completely out of the blue. Sorry, I'm still not sure about that. Yeah. Well, please stop talking to me then. Um, the Interesting <laughs> question. <laughs> um, the other thing we did was we asked the question, did you want version two of CyberTax to be a DOS product or in this new fancy Windows format? And almost 50% of the users, apparently, according to this flyer, said they didn't want it to be in Windows. So version two came out, it was a DOS product as well. And uh, I shortly afterwards, I was headhunted to join BDO as a tax, tax partner. Uh, and uh, CyberTax uh, didn't continue to be developed following my absence. I wasn't allowed to take it with me. Not sure BDO would have been that interested either for that matter. Um, but I learned three important lessons that I'm happy to share with you that may be relevant, uh, I think are, are relevant today. The first one is the, the lesson I learned about pricing. I learned that very early on. It was £345 discounted if you bought it within 14 days of anything, seeing the flyer, hearing me talk about it, receiving the flyer through the post, um, see, seeing the advert. Um, it was a ruse to get people to buy it. And I remember my secretary used to get very upset if anybody actually paid three, four, five, because she knew that most people got it at the discounted price. We're open and honest about this, I, I hasten to add. Remember, this was back in the days where people had to send a check. Um, and we would then fax the order form through to the distributor who would print the diskettes and the user guides and send those off to the accountants who wanted them. Second lesson, which I've already referenced, was the advertising one, never to pay the rate card and to have an advert professionally designed. You know, all this nonsense here, all this writing, it was you know, all well and good. I talked about uh, um, what existing users thought and key features, and I separated it all out into sensible sections, a very easy to operate, detailed user guide. Who wants detailed user guides these days? But these days, I would absolutely uh, engage and have done many, many times uh, good marketing copywriters uh, to assist rather than rely on my own amateur expertise. Although 30 years later, I'm less of an amateur than I was, it's probably fair to say. The third important uh, lesson was to offer the guarantee, which nobody claimed on. And I've been offering guarantees as regards my um, sole practice club before that, uh, other groups that I used to run um, and uh, webinars that I run can offer money back guarantees. I don't think anybody has ever claimed on them, but it offers peace of mind up front. Uh, and obviously I never offer a guarantee that you won't, won't be prepared to uh, except uh, if the claim is ever made. There's always the possibility there will be. In my line of work, working with accountants and tax advisors, I don't think anybody's ever taken advantage of my good nature uh, or exploited my willingness to offer, offer a guarantee. The fourth and final lesson, which is a key one, which I wasn't aware of when we launched CyberTax uh, at the end of 1994, uh, maybe mid-1994, and that was the importance of the volume that you're hoping to sell. You see, I looked at the value that I thought we were offering with CyberTax. Remember, 30 years ago, I was asking smaller firms of accountants to pay 295, 345 pounds, 245, whatever, that sort of amount of money. These days, that's a that was a lot of money a lot of money back then, it's a lot of money now. Um, and we sold quite well. We didn't sell as well as we might have done because somebody else had had the same idea as me. I know that because their product launched within one week of CyberTax. I suspect they may have rushed it out, but many of you watching this video, if you've got this far, will recognize the name Tim Good. Uh, veteran uh, tax lecturer. We were both on the circuit at the same time 30 years ago. And I remember we had an advert in Taxation magazine for CyberTax. And within minutes of taxation landing on his desk that Friday morning, Tim was on the phone to me. We met, we knew each other through the circuit. 
desperate to get a hold of Cybertax. He said it sounded incredible. I was thrilled. I knew that I was onto a winner here. And I explained that our process involved faxing orders and sending stuff off. He didn't have time for that. Could he come and pick up my copy of the diskette and my user get, uh, manual from my office that morning? And sure enough, he did, gave me his check. Fantastic. I went home over the weekend, really, really excited. Um, the following week, I think it was only a week or so later, Tim launched TaxFast. Um, PTP software was launched. And clearly, as a tax lecturer, he'd encountered the same issues, challenges that I had when I was writing the book, uh, that he needed examples. And he'd recognized, as I had, that accountants would need uh, something to help them compare all these different strategies and opportunities and options that were available. Now, I never had this conversation with Tim, but I suspect the pricing of tax fast was influenced by the pricing of cyber tax. Cyber tax, remember, you could get for 245 or 295. Tax fast was launched at just 100 pounds and he cleaned up. The fact that it wasn't as good as cyber tax initially, uh, modesty aside, uh, was irrelevant. Six months later, he did his first upgrade. That was another 50 pounds. There was another upgrade another six months later. So he was getting closer to 200, 250 pounds over a period, but from a much larger audience. And he incorporated into tax fast the things that we'd thought of in cyber tax that he didn't have in tax fast at the time. Never begrudged him that. I was envious. Because, of course, the other big issue was Tim was ahead of the field because TaxFast was a Windows product. And that's probably the other reason why it really took off comparison with CyberTax, plus the fact that I had to give up on CyberTax. So that is why I'm feeling nostalgic. There's some interesting lessons there. Hopefully you're a little bit amused by the way that uh, my excitement was so short lived. But every time I hear people these days talking about basis period reform and uh, choosing when to change their year end, you can understand why I'm getting just a little bit nostalgic for cyber tax. Uh, it was a long time ago now, uh, and it's probably something I will never do again. Thanks for watching and let me know your thoughts and if you have any memories of cyber tax too.